Kia ora from New Zealand. Welcome to this presentation on using records and context ontology in Islandora on behalf of Archive Central. My name is Jonathan Hunt. I work at Catalyst IT. I'm based in Christchurch, New Zealand. And because of the time zone difference uh, for LD4, I'm pre-recording this, uh, but I should be available on Slack later uh, to answer any questions that you might have. The slides for this presentation are available at the URL on the screen. So this is a project that Catalyst undertook on behalf of Archive Central last year and that we are currently supporting. Archive Central is a consortium of nine uh, regional and local councils in the central North Island of New Zealand. They run a physical archive where they have uh, rooms and shelves and boxes of physical records, including photographs and maps and a digital repository. We migrated them from a Ruby on Rails repository called Kete to Islandora 8. If you're not familiar with Islandora 8, it's a digital repository that uses Drupal content management system as the front end, Fedora Commons repository as the back end, it uses Apache Solar, uh, BlazeGraph Triple Store, and a range of other microservices to manage digital media. When we looked around for the best data model to suit records, uh, Archive Central, we discovered uh, the Records and Context Ontology from the International uh, Council of Archives. And at the time, they had released their version 0 0.2 of the conceptual model and it had an associated ontology. One of the things that Islandora is very strong on is linked data. So we applied the records and context ontology uh, into Islandora 8 and I'll tell you about how that went for us. Uh, so we migrated around 200,000 records. Uh, a percentage of those were photographs uh, that had been scanned and PDF documents. There was information associated with those records as well in the form of agents, primarily organizations, uh, places. We also migrated some location and container data uh, so they could track where these records were physically located. Uh, this is a uh, screenshot of uh, what one record looks like in the current system. If I visit that page, uh, then you'll see what it looks like. You can visit the CRL yourself. Uh, this particular record is an aerial photograph and it uses OpenSea Dragon and the Cantaloupe IIIF server to give you uh, image zooming so that you can zoom. Uh, right into the detail of the image and you'll see on the page there's various metadata fields such as identifiers, descriptive note, uh, dates, uh, linked agent which is whatever organization uh, or person might have been involved with the creation uh, or production of that record, the type of content, uh, what record set it belongs to, accession reference, identifiers, uh, location data in terms of the physical tracking of the underlying uh, photograph. So records and context came from uh, the International uh, Council for Archives and they formed the expert group on archival description uh, to come up with a new standard. It's based on previous archival standards, in particular EAC CPF, uh, so, it, but it's intended to bring uh, archiving metadata into the linked data era. So 2016 was the first draft, they're up to version 0 0.02, um, though they have indicated that this is pretty close to a 1.0 release. Uh, I've included links there to the conceptual model and the ontology. The ontology is in the form of OWL and you can load that into uh, Protégé or similar tools. 
Uh, as a non-archivist, I perceive the development process to be somewhat opaque and slow, um, but nevertheless, it's uh, a vital effort to bring records and archives uh, beyond the document-centric era of XML and into the linked data knowledge graph world of uniform resource identifiers, uh, resource description framework, um, web ontology language, and Sparkle queries. Um, and I find that quite exciting, both because the possibilities of discoverability based on a graph network um, are significant, and also that this kind of data standard can potentially uh, support long-term data preservation independent of any one format like XML or JSON um, and independent of any one app. Uh, so I think it's a, a healthy development for the long-term preservation of information. Uh, so records and context uh, is uh, the conceptual model defines entities, attributes and relations. Entities are examples of uh, nouns such as record, record set, corporate body, and so forth. Uh, attributes, uh, but entities have attributes, so that means that, um, sorry, let me just organize my notes here. Uh, each entity will have a set of attributes, uh, and that might include things like name, identifier, uh, descriptive note, other, uh, other kinds of uh, attributes and relationships. So one of the big things is to capture the rich relationships between entities um, across the system. So version 0.2 has 22 entities, 41 attributes and 78 relations, uh, which might not sound a whole lot in terms of, in comparison to other standards like CDOC CRM, uh, but that set of, of um, Definitions provides ample opportunity to model most scenarios, I think, within the context of archives. There's always room uh, for expansion over time, but this is a very powerful uh, foundation to work from. This is another view of the hierarchy, and I've highlighted the entities that we have utilized in the context of Archive Central. So you'll see that all entities inherit from a top entity, which is um, RIC Entity 01 thing. And there's an implied hierarchy moving from left to right here. Uh, records are all instances of a record resource. In particular, we have record set, which is akin to collection. And we have record, which is akin to an object. Uh, and then the digital side of that is RAC E06, which is an instantiation. So if you have a record, it might be instantiated as a digital scan, for example, or a PDF. And these records are contextualized by their relationship with, for example, agents. And that uh, utilizes the CPF approach. So we have corporate bodies, we have person, persons, and we have family. Uh, so those should be fairly familiar. Uh, they're further contextualized in terms of an agent might have been uh, in a position or a role. They may have um, an activity or there may have been events and they may have been acting under a certain mandate or rule. Um, and all of these things happen um, according to dates and potentially relative to places. Uh, so in terms of mapping this into Islandora, uh, record sets, i.e. a series in archival terms, uh, map to Drupal nodes, and in turn they collect records, which are also Drupal nodes. Instantiation, which is tends to be the digital media uh, managed by Drupal Media and Files. And those are contextualized by agents and places. So for example, corporate body, family, person, or place. But those are all mapped to Drupal taxonomy terms. 
there was a few uh, kinds of information that Archive Central wanted that were not directly addressed by the Records and Context Standard. So in particular accessions, which are essentially incoming record sets and records, and also containers and locations, so the actual day-to-day -day management of storage are not part of the RIC standard. So we added um, our own content types for those, uh, somewhat modelled on archive space. There's also some other supplementary uh, details in the system. For example, we are managing Creative Commons and rights statements uh, definitions for licensing in terms of rights taxonomy terms there's also the other kinds of things that you might expect in a content management system for example newsletters as nodes and basic pages as nodes in Islandora the mapping from the fields in these different entities to the linked data fields are handled through RDF mapping YAML files. So these are part of the code base, but they're essentially configuration rather than, say, PHP or JavaScript code. Um, I should point out that the mapping to records and context ontology is only partial. Uh, we felt it was the best model and it's working well for us so far. Uh, but there's a bunch that we didn't include because it wasn't in scope. So for example at this point Archive Central is not using events, uh, not using rules and mandates, not using position, um, though there's every possibility that these kinds of things will come into play in the future. Uh, we kind of skip over group which if you remember that diagram I showed you is a um, ab abstract class essentially um, because Drupal lets you share fields between content types in any case without necessarily needing to inherit from a common abstract class. Uh, one of the things Islandora offers is the uh, Library of Congress extended date time format uh, for dates. So that's essentially ca capturing dates as a string. Uh, EDTF allows you to express uh, uncertainty and imprecision in dates which is entirely suitable for an archive dating back you know, 150 years, uh, but it's not the same as the Records and Context classes. Uh, records and Context defines date as a class in order to provide additional attributes. Uh, for example, where was that date derived from and so forth. Um, if we need to track that information, we'll, we'll look at our options there, but at this point, it's easier for us to use the EDTF date strings rather than the class. Uh, also, in Island Tora, uh, the relation is from an instantiation or media file to the parent node, uh, which is slightly opposite to the direction of the relationship as commonly expressed in records and context. Uh, but records and context habitually defines inverse relationships in any case. Uh, also, records and context, strictly speaking, models relations as classes as well again so that they can have attributes uh, in order to capture provenance data but at this point we can capture a lot of that information through the revision tracking inside Islandora uh, so we haven't gone down the track of modeling them as complete classes. There's also a record part RIC Entity 5 we're not currently using that but that adds another layer of hierarchy to essentially create what could be called a compound object. So if you had some tightly related information, for example, a postcard which has a scan of the, the front side and the rear of the uh, postcard, you might want to tightly associate those together and that's where record part would be a good option. Uh, so we have some, some candidate uh, data to use there, but we haven't implemented it at this point. This is a quick look at what uh, one part of the data model looks like, specifically um, records and context agents. You'll see agent inherits from thing and in turn breaks down into things like person and corporate body, also family, uh, but at this point there's not a whole lot of family data in, in the council data set, so we haven't really used that to any great extent. 
The main thing to note here is that agent has, uh, there are relations between agents, in particular is antecedent of and is successor of. So as uh, organizations are formed or dissolved from other organizations, we can track that kind of thing in terms of beginning date, end date, antecedent and successor relations. So if I show you a little bit of what we have here with this is a set of um, agents, primarily organizations, uh, county councils, rabbit boards and the like uh, that have um, at some point been uh, generators of the records that are now held by Archive Central. Um, if I show you an example of what that looks like on the live system, uh, I can go to the site, I see my list of agents, I can filter on something like Palmerston North City Council, which is a currently existing council. If I visit the agent information for Palmerston North City Council, can see at some point that uh, there was a town where well, they control the town clerks, uh, clerks department. That organization in turn maintains uh, a range of record sets including electoral uh, roll. Let me just track that down. And you can see that these date back to 1894. So if I look at that particular record set, I can now see a list of records. I can click on an individual record, in this case Burgess Roll Number 3, and you can see that this has been scanned and turned into a PDF. Uh, so I can browse that PDF, I could download it. Um, you can see the metadata that's been included uh, for that particular record. Here's another example of an agent, and you can see again, identifier, beginning date, end date, bit of his, uh, historical note, and some antecedent and successor relationships. This next screen is an example of the edit form that Drupal provides. If I zoom into that, it just gives you a taste of uh, what the, the administrative user interface looks like. In this case, uh, we used the labels on uh, within the Drupal form API to uh, provide a reference back to the records and context ontologies so that in many cases the fields map directly to the attributes that have been defined in the standard. So if anybody doing data entry has any question about what should go in a given field, they can refer back to the specific attribute or entity uh, in the records and context ontology. In this case, there's a fixed vocabulary for corporate body type. Uh, there's the name, which is records and context attribute 28. You can list alternate names. Uh, there's the has beginning date and has end date. Um, those are modeled as relationships because you'll recall that the records and context ontology tracks those as independent classes uh, but we're using edtf hence the uh, description for the field about how to enter uh, edtf information there's attribute 22 for identifier uh, you can relate this organization to other entities for example uh, councils that um, it was either a predecessor or a successor for. There's descriptive note, uh, historical note, and so forth. And that's just for, um, that's a, essentially a taxonomy term uh, in the context of Drupal, but that can then be referred to uh, for any given record. Uh, this is what the, uh, based on the information that was put in, on that field, uh, that data is stored into Drupal and persisted into Fedora Commons repository and into Blazegraph Triple Store 
using JSON linked data. This is an example of what the JSON linked data looks like. So all of the records, record sets, taxonomy terms uh, can all be exposed as JSON linked data. And you'll see here that, uh, for example, we are mapping simultaneously uh, to schema.org slash name and records and contacts hash name. Uh, so using those uh, RDF YAML mappings, we can map to multiple uh, ontologies at the same time. And that is all indexed into BlazeGraph and Flora repo. Uh, and because it is in uh, BlazeGraph, we can issue Sparkle queries against, uh, pardon me, let's just, sorry, let's get back to the screen here. We can issue Sparkle queries against BlazeGraph. There isn't a public facing user interface for BlazeGraph uh, in Islandora just now. Uh, so this is more of an administrator or developer uh, user interface. But there are some quite interesting possibilities for how we could offer this in terms of visualization and uh, public query systems um, in the near future. So this is just a relatively simple Sparkle query that references RDF and a records and context ontology and requests the name uh, of uh, any corporate bodies that were dissolved in 1989. And in this case, there are 61 results if you run that query. We can also look at uh, the relationships between, for example, Palmas North City Council and its immediate uh, predecessors or antecedents. In this case, their immediate predecessors, there are three results, uh, Manawatu County Council, Manawatu District Council and Oroa County Council. Um, and using and those kind of queries are great, but not a whole lot different to what you might be able to do with the traditional uh, relational database. Uh, where triple stores and the knowledge graph really shine is the ability to traverse hierarchies. So uh, this is an example of using uh, the Sparkle uh, property path. So if you look at the plus symbol after is antecedent of that essentially recurses through the hierarchy to look at not just the immediate predecessors of Palmerston North City Council, but their predecessors as well. And it pulls out their name, the name of the predecessor organization, the date that predecessor organization ended, and what the successor organization's name was called. And in this case, we get 35 results going all the way back to 1876. Um, so it's those kind of, of more powerful queries that traverse the graph network and potentially reference both records and contextualized metadata that really start to demonstrate the potential. Um, and again, this is quite raw. Um, if I get the chance to present again in a year, I'd, I'd like to think we've got some really exciting visualizations based on this kind of information. Just to recall, um, there's a lot more to records and context than the aspects that we have implemented. For example, events and activities, uh, the mandates and rules, and the richer date information. So there's plenty of opportunity to grow the system to accommodate more of what records and context offers. I've linked here some resources. Uh, the first few are just general linked data resources that I've found useful uh, for helping people get up to speed on linked data concepts. For example, chapter one of Van Huyen and Verbal, uh, and recently through ALA is linked data for the perplexed librarian. Uh, I can also recommend the six week uh, HPI uh, knowledge graph uh, online course. And with respect to records and context specifically, there's uh, some PDF slides available along with, uh, I recommend having a browse of the conceptual model and the ontology and also giving Islandora a look. Um, if you have any questions, get hold of me as Kayaka in the LD4 conference Slack uh, or contact me using the email address there. I hope this little taste of records and context has piqued your interest and I hope you have a wonderful conference. Thank you for listening.